Good morning, welcome to Insiders. It's one of the oldest mottos in politics. Throw enough mud and some of it will stick. It doesn't always work, of course, but politicians thrive on the challenge. It certainly worked with Mark Latham, and now, because so much of Labor's fortunes depends on Kevin Rudd's individual performance, the Coalition is having another go. Now, they justify this partly because Kevin Rudd made his life story part of his political narrative when he produced that long television advertisement. This is the part of country Australia where my parents raised me. Like many of their generation, Mum and Dad didn't get much past primary school. But they worked hard on the land and they raised a family. We all went to this local school and by the standards of that time we got a good education. And so again this week the Coalition was casting doubt on Kevin Rudd's recollections as an 11 year old, the eviction from the farm and the circumstances of his father's death. All too self-serving to be true, according to Tony Abbott, and he says that's not mudslinging, just a political critique. But Rod Cameron from ANOP, a former Labor advisor, has conducted focus groups on the subject and he thinks it's all backfiring. I'm only interested in this issue because I think it has been so badly reported, not by everybody, but by the majority of the gallery, who saw it as a, as a, as a horse race, who's, who, who are answering the question, is Rudd being damaged and is his honeymoon over? Wrong question. The question was, is Howard being damaged? And the answer is yes. But former Liberal campaign director and now Federal Minister Andrew Robb argues it's all legitimate. I think there's a lot of politics being played in the last couple of weeks about the whole suggestion of mudslinging. To hold the most powerful job in the country, to be responsible for the lives of 20 million Australians. And he, Kevin Rudd, if he wants that position, is entitled to want it and try for it. But he has to accept that people need to find out what's in his heart. What maketh the man? It is our job, it's our legitimate job, to question and probe and to hold up for public assessment the characteristics of that individual. The irresistible urge to throw mud, our major topic this morning for our analyst Paul Kelly and for the panel, and of course the sudden resignation on Friday of another minister, the second in two weeks, Senator Santo Santoro. We'll give you a detailed look at his Friday news conference, one of the most bizarre you'll ever see. And our program guest is Labor's shadow treasurer, Wayne Swan. That's all coming up on Insiders, but first for the news headlines overnight, it's good morning, Katrina Blouse. Thanks, Barry. Good morning. A plane carrying the Prime Minister has been forced to make an emergency landing during a secret trip to southern Iraq. John Howard was flying to Baghdad after visiting Australian troops when the cabin of the RAAF transport he was in filled with smoke. The Hercules landed at an army base and Mr Howard was rushed off the plane by his SAS bodyguards. The cause of the smoke is not clear. We're in very good hands. I mean, it's... Uh... Rather be in the hands of the RAF than anybody else in a situation like that. <laughs> Mr Howard continued his trip to Baghdad where he met Iraqi Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki. Meanwhile, at least eight people have been killed and several hundred more injured in a wave of poisonous gas attacks in and around the Iraqi city of Fallujah. Suicide bombers driving tankers loaded with chlorine targeted three separate locations. Hundreds of thousands of people will take part Sydney Harbour Bridge to mark its 75th year. As part of the celebrations, five yellow tiger moth planes will pass over the bridge, along with a helicopter flyover later today. A new memorial will also be unveiled, commemorating the 16 workers killed during construction of the bridge. And Barry, I'll be back with more news at 11 o'clock. Katrina, thank you. And now to our program guest, Labor Shadow Treasurer Wayne Swan. Good morning and welcome. Good morning, Barry. Great to be here. Based on what we've just seen, it's uh, clearly a dangerous exercise just visiting the troops in Iraq. It certainly is. I don't think it matters whether, whether you're the Prime Minister or a private. We sort of hope and pray that everyone gets home safely. You've got to give him credit under the circumstances to, to go on visits like this to Afghanistan and Iraq. Absolutely. It's something that every Prime Minister ought to do. Now, when the Parliament resumes on Tuesday, um, Senator Santoro obviously will be, uh, will be an issue, but w where do you take it by then? Well, I think the revelations this morning are simply stunning, Barry. I mean, the Prime Minister gave Senator Santoro a clean bill of health last October, then again last Tuesday. Now we find out there are three more conflicts of interest involved in Senator Santoro on top of the 72 failures to disclose. But in what way are they conflicts of interest? Well, 
according to the newspapers this morning, three companies in which he had shares directly relate to his former portfolio. They weren't disclosed. So what's the Prime Minister been doing? I mean, even by his elastic standards of ministerial responsibility, these are stunning breaches and the Prime Minister simply hasn't been on the ball here. He hasn't had his eye on the main game. That's fairly clear. But the Prime Minister said that he, he did tell him he did tell him to uh, to check his chair portfolios and get his house in order, and that's why he's so angry. But what was the Prime Minister doing for the, for the six-month period? First of all, he disclosed in October. Then last Tuesday, the Prime Minister said, oh, look, not a hanging offence, just a failure to disclose. Then suddenly, out of the blue on Friday, we find out there are another 72 breaches. What's the Prime Minister been doing to enforce his, uh, his own code of conduct during that six-month period. But what more can he do other than to say to, to, to the ministers, look, these are the rules, these are the guidelines. Well, he could have been on the job, Barry. He could have been on the job. He could have been conducting an audit. If he takes his code of conduct as seriously as he says that he does, what was he doing during that six-month period? And what was he doing last Tuesday when he gave him another clean bill of health? What's going on uh, within the Liberal Party in, in Queensland, given that this information has come out this morning and it, it seems to be a bit of a drip feed going on? Is uh, the Liberal Party doing this to themselves? They certainly are. They're, pour they're pouring the mud bucket all over themselves. I mean, all of these stories have generally been generated from the underworld of the Queensland uh, Liberal Party, the factional wars that are going on in the party in that state. But why? What's, uh, what's happening? Well, I think there's something sick in the Liberal Party in Queensland. That's been apparent for a long time. What is stunning about Senator Santoro is that Senator Santoro has been Mr Howard's number one numbers man in Queensland for a very long period of time. So the Prime Minister also has a direct linkage to the state of the Liberal Party in Queensland. But, Barry, that's a matter for the Liberal Party in Queensland. Well, given that this is going on, and of course Kevin Rudd is a Queenslander, do you think this will hand Labor some seats on a plate at the, uh, the federal election? Well, there's a mood for change out there in the electorate, Barry. We can see it at every level. I'd rather be here this morning talking about national economic policy and where we go post the resources boom and all of the issues involved with that. But in Queensland particularly, we need to win a large number of seats. We are opt optimistic that we can do that and we're going to be out there trying as hard as we can to take half a dozen seats from the Liberal Party in Queensland. Well, there's another story in the newspapers this morning suggesting that the former Immigration Minister, Senator Amanda Vanstone, was uh, taking Mandarin lessons uh, on the taxpayer. Uh, is that something that you'll pursue in the Parliament? Well, there's no doubt that there is a sense of entitlement and arrogance about Howard Government Ministers at the moment. I mean, you saw former Minister... Hargrave and some of his attitudes in the last couple of months and then Senator Vanstone has apparently spent $70,000 to unsuccessfully learn Mandarin. I mean that's, uh, that's pretty stunning by anybody's standards. But given that she was Immigration Minister and had to deal with the Chinese, can you justify it in a sense? Well I think there are many people in the community who have a hunger to learn a foreign language who go out and pay for it themselves. I didn't see it in the, in the, in the job statement issued by John Howard. Do you think some of this mud that has been thrown around will stick on Kevin Rudd? Oh, I think that's the objective of the government and I don't think they're going to stop. The, the smear campaign is going to continue. Tony Abbott made that very clear. And the smear campaign, I think, will be followed by the fear campaign, the distortion of Labor policies. That, that's the next stage after they continue to attack Kevin Rudd's character and other people on our front bench because, you see, they are so far behind in the debate about the future and they've been so unsuccessful in combating Kevin Rudd when it comes to the plans he's put forward for an education revolution, our approach to climate change, they've got no other tactic left. But why shouldn't they pursue him? Right from the start they got a concession from Kevin Rudd that he lacked judgement. Now that's a victory for the coalition. Well he was man enough to admit that he made a mistake in going to a dinner where Brian Burke was present. We've got a Prime Minister that has never admitted making a mistake in his 11 years in power. And I think there's a very, very stark contrast between the approach of the two. And they've certainly turned the heat up on Kevin in the last couple of weeks. It's been a smear campaign against Kevin personally and Kevin's family. And I think the way in which Kevin has handled that has shown the Australian people the strength and the sense of purpose that Kevin Rudd has in the face of the pressure from the coalition. But he's got to face up to this surely as Andrew Robb pointed out just a little earlier on. He wants to be Prime Minister of the country Absolutely. so let's, let's see what's in his heart. But there's, so let's there's see a difference, what sort of judgment he has. Barry, there's a big difference between a personal smear campaign and asking legitimate questions about policies and character. Now these guys have simply gone over the top and as I, as I said earlier in the week lost the plot and they're not really going to the core of Kevin Rudd's character or our policies. What they're doing is simply throwing as much mud as they possibly can, hoping that some of it sticks. And I'll tell you what, Barry, 
at this stage of the contest, it's not sticking to Kevin Rudd. It's all over, splattered all over the Prime Minister, Tony Abbott and Alexander Downer. I mean, we had Alexander Downer on this program last week calling people grubs. The Australian people don't want that standard of behaviour from Howard Government Ministers. They want them running the country. Well, let's talk about the economy now, and uh, I'm sure it'll be a central issue, certainly if the, if the government gets its way at the next election. The Prime Minister was out and about during the week uh, rehearsing one line that I think you'll hear over and over again. Let's have a listen to that now. The Labor Party has successfully created the impression that it doesn't matter who is in government, the economy will continue to grow. Uh, they have successfully created the impression that somehow or other the economy runs on an autopilot and it's got nothing to do with good governance. So I think you'll hear plenty of that, that you simply can't take economic management for granted. Well, Barry, we're into the future business. We're not in the fear and smear business. And since the beginning of January, we've been out there talking about policies to lift the productive capacity of the economy through an education revolution, political leadership on infrastructure and so on. What's the government been talking about? They've been out there throwing mud at us. They haven't been out there saying, well, our plans to lift productivity in the economy are X, Y and Z. They've not been out there talking about what we're going to do post the resources boom to make sure that uh, we continue to build wealth creation in this economy. They've not been out there talking about any of those But you things. said it yourself during the week that Australia has enjoyed an uninterrupted uh, expansion of the, of the economy now, the longest in our history, 15 years. We have, and, and we're proud of that, and we played a part in that. But the central question in Australian politics is, what do we do when the resources boom turns down? You see, Barry, last year we had the strongest world growth for 30-plus years, and we've all benefited benefited from that, but that's not going to go on forever. What are we going to do to make sure we can lift our services exports, we can lift our manufactured exports? What are we going to do post the resources boom to lift the, the productive capacity of the economy, to lift income and living standards for the long term? And most importantly, what are we going to do to put downward pressure on inflation and downward pressure on interest rates? Because that's where this government has been very complacent. But it's not just about uh, the resources boom. Living standards are up by 50%. Uh -huh. Unemployment down from 8.5% to 4.5%. If it ain't broke, comes to mind. Exactly, Barry. So what we have to do is to plan for the next decade, not for the next election. So the government has got a test in this coming budget. What is it going to do? Is it going to put in place a range of policies that lift productivity, put downward pressure on inflation and interest rates, or is it going to go on one of its desperate spending sprees? That's the test for the government in this budget. What will it do to build prosperity for the future beyond the mining boom? What do you think they'll do? Well, I think they'll probably go on their spending spree. There's some evidence out there that they're about to turn the spending tap on. They've got a contingency reserve out there, Barry. It's got $20 billion in it, twice as much as it had four years ago. That's an indicator to me that we might be about to see what John Howard and Peter Costello have always done just before the election. Where does that go figure come from, spree. the $20 billion? It comes from the budget papers. It's there in addition to the surpluses available to be spent available to be spent and twice the level that it was four years ago you see it's prudent to have a contingency reserve but at the moment the contingency reserve is twice the level that it was four years ago so that indicates to me that john howard and peter costello in addition to being desperate and running their fear and smear campaigns might be about to try and spend their way back to win, to, and in those circumstances, what, what would you do? Would you try and match them dollar for dollar? No. The most the important way? thing we have to do is direct our spending to the productive basis of the economy, the, the productive core of the economy. And that's why we've said new spending should be particularly directed at education and training and innovation. And we've got to meet the challenge of climate change as well. So that means clean coal technologies and renewables. Spending in this budget has to be directed for the next decade not just for the next election. But you think about that in terms of decades, if, if people are thinking about their prosperity into the next decade, why wouldn't they rely on the, on the mob that delivered them prosperity well, in the last decade? Well, because this government has been complacent. It's been complacent and the consequences are now being felt. Productivity is down, Barry. If we don't lift productivity in this economy, we can't lift our future living standards. We just can't rely upon the income boost that is coming from the mining boom. We haven't done enough to lift productivity so we can lift future living standards so that the comfort people have now will continue to be there well into the future. I just wanted to ask you about superannuation, which is another topic that you raised during the week, that over time you want somebody on average earnings to achieve a 15% total super That's contribution right, yeah. with a 3% contribution of their own. What do you mean by over time, over what sort of time? 
Well, as soon as it is affordable for the economy, I also made it very clear, Barry, that we won't be spending money uh, that we don't have. We've got very strict spending limits and we're not going to be out there lifting taxation to meet our objectives. We've got to rearrange spending within the budget. We've made that very clear. But so I'm is really, this on I'm, the never-never in a way? No, it's not on the never-never. But uh, we, we recognise the importance of providing adequate retirement income for those low- and middle-income earners, particularly in their 50s, who have missed out from the benefits of the, of the current package that the government has put forward. We think these are the matters we ought to be debating on a daily basis. No, I'm sure Not people the would say 15 per cent for a 3 per cent contribution will take that, but when you talk about affordable, uh, who needs no, no, to well, afford it? Do the employers need to afford it or will it be a government No, no, we're talking about enhancing the co-contribution scheme, Barry. That is the government stump, stumping up more money and the individual putting forward some additional money as well. But we've just said that we're going to be very mindful of the financial situation at the time. But we have not given up on that objective of ensuring adequate retirement incomes for all Australians, not just some Australians. And just finally, on the New South Wales election, uh, if the polls hold up, of course, Labor will be re-elected. Does that make your task more difficult federally, given that the Coalition can talk about coast-to-coast -coast Labor Look, governments? I don't believe it matters either way. I see that the New South Wales opposition leader has simply given up. Well, I've got uh, in Morris Emma someone who is completely resolute and I certainly hope he wins the election. Thanks for your time this morning. Thank you. I think the politicians are definitely missing the real issues right now, being what I believe the real issues being healthcare and education. I think politicians should be concentrating upon policy rather than just slandering each other. I don't think Australians necessarily want to hear about the mudslinging. They want to hear about policies and options. It's part of life politics anywhere in the world. You're going to have yeah, them. Yeah, but hold on for it. For I think the entertainment value should be better. They need to get some better dirt on them. <laughs> <laughs> they should dig deeper. Issues that the politicians should be talking about in the moment are certainly, uh, we'll discuss health and education, but the work workplace relations. I'm finding it very difficult to fill positions in, in, the, in the kitchen. Uh, there's just no skilled apprentices out there. I think the issues are definitely health and education and the environment, but I also think that aged care and childcare should be carefully considered. I think water management is going to decide how I vote um, in the upcoming election. There's all this talk about water crisis, but I really think it's a water management crisis. The single most important issue for me would be the economy. Because for Australia to stay as prosperous as what it has been, we've got to continue, just can't stop. There's got to be imaginative ways that we can progress in the global economy. I think some of the most crucial issues, and one of them is definitely Iraq. We've uh, gone to Iraq just on the back of America. We've become a terrorist target for something that isn't really going to help Iraq. Kevin Rudd riding high in the polls at the moment. I'm not too sure if he can hold on to the federal election. I think he certainly is riding high, but I think that it will even up. Well, Malcolm Farr, uh, it, it seems to be the consensus whenever focus groups get together that uh, they don't like the mudslinging um, and that it's backfiring in this case. Do you think that's, that's right? Uh, my focus groups differ. Uh, I, I, think, I think people are fascinated in hearing um, about politicians. They don't want one-dimensional people out there. They want to know what the flesh and blood and the heartbeat is that's going on. Um, they can, when things backfire, they can criticise, say, the government at the moment, but they want to hear more about the politicians and the people they might uh, elect to be Prime Minister. Andrew Robb was spot on. And mudslinging? Is that what you, how you would describe it, Andrew? No, I don't uh, describe it as that at all. It's a, a question of examining uh, someone's personality to see if they fit. When we had a look at uh, Mark Latham, for example, people, whatever they might think about mudslinging, they made a decision, I think, in large part driven by an assessment of his very, very flawed character, and they got it right. Character counts, and an examination of it is important in the political judgment. Well, yeah, in that but case, it was said, it's really important that when you apply the blowtorch, that you have your own house in order. And people people apply the mm. blowtorch in politics for two reasons. One is they want the public to start listening to potentially damaging information about that politician, and the other is they want to damage the psychology of someone who is challenging for government. But when you do that, it's really critical that you actually aren't then open yourself oh, to the similar kind of attack. You are absolutely right. And uh, in, the case, in this case, as I've said before, the government has exposed itself to that exactly that sort of standard.
But it's not to say it's illegitimate to question someone's character. No, no, and in this case, the exaggerations told by Kevin Rudd about his uh, father's uh, tragic death. I think that's important. Well, there's a lot yeah. to be said on this issue, and we will get back to it. But it's time now to bring in Paul Kelly, political commentator with The Australian, uh, to join us now for some background and analysis. Uh, Paul, good morning uh, and welcome. We'll start with Santo Santoro. And uh, uh, you were at the Friday's news conference at uh, Parliament House in, in Canberra. What were your impressions? Uh, Barry, I think the performance of uh, Santo Santoro is quite stunning in terms of the breach involved of ministerial standards and behaviour. I mean, frankly, uh, this issue is red hot. Uh, he revealed that there are about 70 separate uh, share <coughs> transactions or activities that he failed to disclose over an 18-month period, uh, failed to disclose to either the Senate or to the Prime Minister. And this morning, of course, we've got news reports that some of the companies in which he held shares were also involved in his uh, portfolio act in his portfolio activity so there could also be a conflict of interest uh, involved there i think frankly it's almost inconceivable to think that he forgot about all this that all this just happened by accident and in that sense i do find the explanation he gave at his friday press conference to be unconvincing we should remember that last october he sold shares in one company where there was a conflict of interest. Uh, the Prime Minister gave him the benefit of the doubt on that occasion, but it's surely extraordinary that when he corrected his affairs then, he didn't address the other issue of the full disclosure of all the other share activities that he had. Well, to what extent then does this leave the Prime Minister exposed on the issue? Well, John Howard is very exposed on this issue, and the tone of his press conference from the Middle East last Friday was very interesting. I thought the Prime Minister came over as angry, he admitted that he was angry, frustrated, and there was almost a sense of betrayal uh, about this issue. John Howard said that it's possible to make one mistake by inadvertence, but you can't make scores of mistakes uh, the same way. Uh, I think uh, the trouble for the Prime Minister here is that he's been undermined by foolish behaviour on the part of too many ministers who are operating not just in an improper manner, but also in an incompetent manner. This has been the problem uh, facing the government over the last uh, several weeks. And Howard knows, of course, that at the end of the day, he is responsible and the Labor Party will hold him responsible. And of course, the issue has been about character and judgment now for, for weeks. Um, where do you think that issue sits? The danger for the government now is that uh, this is becoming, I think, a substantial negative for the government. The government looks as though it's losing this debate about parliamentary standards and political character. Uh, I've got no doubt the government is fully entitled uh, to probe Kevin Rudd's career. The question is whether this tactic is working for the government. Now, consider the balance sheet. The government's lost two ministers who've been forced to resign. It's got three Liberal MPs from Brisbane being investigated by the Australian Federal Police. It's got Senator Ross Lightfoot from the West, who's in trouble over share trading. When you look at the situation at this stage, despite all the twists and turns over the last three weeks, I think the judgment now is that the government is playing to an issue on which it's losing. That is, Labor's performance on this issue of standards looks better than the government's performance. And a further problem for the government, I think, is the danger that its campaign here might typecast the government. John Howard is asking the people, he's inviting the people to make a judgment on an issue where the government's performance seems to be worse than Labor. And the risk for Howard is that in the process, his government is starting to look old, discredited and desperate. And Paul, uh, the, uh, I'll just ask you finally on, the, on Iraq and the, the fourth anniversary of, uh, of the invasion on Tuesday, I think the Prime Minister is planning a speech on Wednesday. He has, of course, been to Afghanistan and now Iraq. Uh, we'll have a look at uh, part of what he uh, had to say to the troops overnight. No nation wants foreign soldiers on its soil indefinitely. No nation wants to be in a foreign country indefinitely. But we have a job to do. We have a job to create a situation where the Iraqis can grab hold of a reasonably democratic future. Now, clearly, the, uh, the trip is designed as a morale-boosting exercise for the troops as much as anything, but, but what's behind the, the, the whole strategy? What's behind the strategy, Barry, is that John Howard intends to campaign this year on Iraq. Frankly, he's got no choice. 
and his policy is that Australia will stay in Iraq uh, in lockstep with President Bush. As you said, John Howard is uh, about to give a major speech on Iraq. Uh, in that speech, he will highlight the great dangers for the West uh, of defeat in Iraq, and he will attack the Labor position. He will argue the Labor position of troop withdrawal is irresponsible and dangerous, and that uh, Kevin Rudd can't be taken seriously in terms of national security credentials if he's got a policy on Iraq which which in fact equates to defeat. John Howard, I think, will try to depict himself in Iraq, which is an, un which is an unpopular war, as a leader of strength and commitment. But of course, that will be quite a difficult ask. Paul Kelly, thanks for your time this morning. And we'll now get on to the Santo Santoro <laughs> matter. And can you believe that it wasn't just one oversight in the end, but as that news conference unfolded, 72? The, the, there, were, there were little back conversations going on there. Uh, uh, you know, People saying in Santo said, uh, well, uh, there was something like 40 to 60. People going, what, 14 to 16? No, I think he said 40 to 60. <laughs> 40 to 60? <laughs> and then we, we get up and <laughs> tally the thing and 70 freaking two. Even when, was, it was even just, when he was confessing, he couldn't he confess. Couldn't, he couldn't yeah. do the right you thing. You know, this oh. is a disgrace. There's, a, there's, only, there's only one really question to ask. Is the man simply a fool or is he dishonest as well? well no. And the thing is here, John Howard is not <laughs> just culpable for not having checked properly that Santoro had indeed declared everything there was to declare after his first egregious error, but is also culpable in having appointed this buffoon to a ministry in the first place. Well, and I think that is well, a big mark against him. That, that, that one, yeah, but I, can't, I don't really think as uh, you and, and Wayne Swan have argued, that the Prime Minister can be on the phone every day asking their ministers, uh, did you do any share trading now? You send a bloke around the office uh, to well, his office. Yeah, send what else have you got? But only you that they've yeah. actually complied. And, and given the, uh, the, the way that the, the whole code of conduct has been handled now over many years since that initial mm. burst, is the Prime Minister responsible for, for um, creating a climate of complacency when it comes to a code of conduct? Well, I think there are real issues about whether people are adhered. And you have to look at the psychology of Santo Santoro in this, that he thought somehow that he didn't have to comply with these rules. In, most senators and MPs, when they first get elected, it's made very, very plain to them that they need to adhere with these de declaration rules in each House of Parliament. And if they don't, there are consequences. But clearly this just missed... Um, it, you know, r r lodging in his brain at that point in time. Well, if it's a Friday, it's just, just before you go on, it was a Friday afternoon uh, news conference. A lot of people might have, might have missed the details. So we'll have a look at some of the edited highlights, the best of, I think. Yeah, here they are. Look, there's approximately um, 50 to 60 oversights. Um, I wish to stress that they, in fact, are over a period of about um, 15 or 16 months. I honestly, you know, am not a, a person that trades, you know, um, intensely. I should say that, um, and uh, I now have an accountant. I have declared, I should say, um, all share transactions since October of last year. As I'm speaking with you now, um, they are in fact, the details of those updates have been delivered to the pecuniary in, uh, um, uh, register, interest register. The Prime Minister said he resolved it with you last year. No, that, Presumably there was, was he some telling conversation that was, in that, his office. Um, that, that, yes, there was. There was a conversation with his office, but that was in relation to CBIO, you know, where I... And you fact, were not asked then to check other shareholders? Um, look, no, I wasn't, because... Uh, Do you think that calls the Prime Minister's judgment into question? It certainly does not, no. But we're not talking about, for example, the case of Mr Rudd, who is the leader, you know, having... Um, dinner with somebody of very dubious character. It's bigger than having dinner, isn't it? No, well, no, I don't, I don't, um, we're talking, we're talking about, Laurie, um, my judgment, we're not talking about the Prime Minister's judgment. You know, yeah. when, um... I think someone who's had dinner with Santoro has had dinner with some <laughs> dubious character, frankly. Indeed. If this whole politics thing doesn't work out for him, there's a career in unintended stand-up comedy, I'm sure. <laughs> and the, the issue about um, how John Howard has managed this, I think, is fascinating because when he was first asked about this in uh, Tokyo and um, the comparison with Ian Campbell's sacking was brought up or resignation was brought up, 
why did Ian Campbell have to go for the 20 minute meeting with Brian Burke whereas Senator Santoro didn't have to go for this oversight? He says, well, he, Senator Santoro was extremely proactive. So the rule <laughs> here with John Howard is no surprises. That's, mm. his, that's his operating code. If you tell him what you've done, if you let him be for, forewarned and forearmed, then he will stand by you if he can. But if you surprise him, if you don't politically manage the situation, you're in a lot of trouble. And how did he come by the judgment that the Senator had been proactive? Uh, by the fact that the senator had written him a letter and explained that he coughing actually, on the sea bio stuff. Yeah, had had mm. confessed to this share. But what Senator Santoro also appears not to have uh, made plain was that the charity to which he supposedly donated these profits was in fact a conservative family group. Um, the head of which had actually advised him to go and buy the shares in the first place, so he just returned the profits to his oh, friend. Hang on, just because it's concerned, I, don't, I don't buy that one. But it's because not a charity. Well, it is. It's, it's a, a charity and, in my. It, it's, no, it's not for profit. It's not a charity for good causes. And if he had donated not to Greenpeace, you wouldn't end. care. No, no, that's, that's not true. conservative. No, that's not true. It's, 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 when you say charity, you think the salvos or something. You I don't mean, think uh, don't uh, that. an anti-abortion well, lobby. He doesn't get a tax free uh, deduction as a result. So, so in the sense a sense that it's, it's even a, it's, more it's a, a non donation. But it was fudging. It was well, definitely fudging. Well, if he'd given it to Greenpeace, you wouldn't care. No, no, it's not a charity. That's true. Either way, if you do political advocacy work, it's not a charity. It's the fact that Booga Booga Conservative. No, it's not. It's a church. It's a church back group. Don't be me no more. Look, there's plenty to hang him on. Uh, don't let's <laughs> you've done that. Donating it back to the mate that gave you the share tip, I yeah, think, is dodgy. Yeah, yeah. He, his initial recollection, too, by the way, in that uh, in what we saw there in the news conference, was that the prime minister hadn't asked him to uh, to check the records. Um, but then, how long afterwards was it when he came back and said, "Well, well essentially, hang on, I've uh, been reminded"? About half, within half an hour of his press conference, he said, oh, "Right, oh, that that <laughs> that prime minister." <laughs> it, 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 it turns out that you know, this checking of shares uh, uh, yeah, and declaration is an ongoing process. It, it's not something you do on your on your birthday or something like that. Now, but he had three instances in which uh, the, the Senate had three instances in which he could have declared. Uh, one was uh, when he got the job as uh, Minister for Age, Ageing um, back in January 2006 when he said he went through his shares to see if there was any conflict of interest. Uh, uh, secondly, when he found the CBO stuff and, uh, and, and, uh, and the Prime Minister asked him to check you know, if there's anything else lurking there. And then thirdly, um, last Tuesday, Tuesday of last week, mm. when the Prime Minister's office asked him to check again and he uh, tripped over this uh, little swag of 72. Uh, <laughs> a little job swag so how the heck could you ignore 72? Mm. When he says it's not a regular show, that, that's one transgression per yeah. week for yeah. his entire career as a Most minister. Have and when he says, when he ended that ludicrous, shameless performance there, and he said, uh, uh, well, I'm very proud of my, my performance in my portfolio, I think mm. we can take that to mean his share portfolio. Is very <laughs> <laughs> and, and before he became a minister, of course, he was, um, and we should declare an interest here, I suppose at least I should, that he was, uh, he was right on the ABC's case for a long time, spent a lot of time investigating the ABC's code of conduct. We'll have a look at, uh, ha have a look at him in the Senate uh, hearings. I mean, if you guys thought that I was a patsy for a previous minister when I first took on the, um, the ABC, as some of your people suggested that I was, I just give you fair warning, there's a whole network of Australians that are monitoring you, and I'm just going to escalate this, you know, as much as I possibly can. I've got close to 900 questions that I want to put to you. I'll run out mercifully merciful, for you um, by the time that my allotted time is, is finished. But now, it's a noble cause to keep taxpayer-funded organisations honest, um, Andrew, but in this case you'd have to say it's bordering on obsession. 900 questions. Barry, Barry, no one is keener than I to root out imbalance on the ABC. <laughs> and no one has probably devoted more column space than I on that subject. But when you look at the kind of questions that uh, Santoro berated the ABC, trivial, stupid little questions. You would so, say that if it was Greenpeace. Um, <laughs> I'd say it, uh, if it was Greenpeace too. When you see that, and I thought even then, when I looked at this, the sort of transcript of what kind of stuff he put out, I thought, how does this guy become a minister? And I repeat, that is really the question to ask the Prime Minister. Why did you put so much trust in a guy like this? Mm. OK, just before he, um, uh, after that news conference on Friday, he then wrote a letter to his constituents. Um, it, it didn't amount in any sense to an apology. It, it was a letter of regret and, and he wanted to thank a few people. But then he ended up with, he, he finished it with a Bruce Lee quote and it said that defeat is not defeat unless accepted as reality in your own mind. Malcolm Fowler, what's he telling us? He's telling us that uh, he doesn't think he's done anything wrong. He didn't really need to uh, to resign, and it sort of supports 
an indication he gave in the press conference that the only reason he's going is because this could be embarrassing to the government during election year. And as uh, Luke McElveen and the Daily Telegraph pointed out, why didn't he quote from The Godfather? Why Bruce Lee? <laughs> <laughs> OK, well, well what it says, it's shameless. That's yeah. what it says, it's shameless. Mm. Mm. We were talking uh, before about, about mudsling, if that's what it is, we'd argue as to, as to whether it is or it isn't. Um, but Matt Price wrote during the week that he suspects as well, deep down, that people don't mind a bit of this. And that's certainly your, your view, Malcolm. Mm. Yeah, it is. Look, look it, it serves a purpose. I mean, as well as titillation, it serves a purpose. Uh, people want to know... The, the more they know about someone, uh, the more comfortable they might be to vote for them. And the parties know this. That's mm -hmm. why we had this extraordinary uh, paid advertisement of Kevin Rudd strolling back through the fields of his youth. Mm -hmm. I mean, clearly they thought that would be valuable to, uh, to Mr Rudd, and they've got to accept that uh, the negatives uh, are going to be just as interesting to voters. I think that's a... You know, uh, Rod Cameron, who was a long-time ALP pollster, well, you, you've got to acknowledge 20 years. that. Yes. I think that's where he is conflating two things, which a lot of journalists have conflated to, to their error. And that is, one, is it legitimate? Two, is it effective? Mm. I think it's legitimate to examine the character of a bloke, and Labor acknowledges this by running this huge ad talking about the very subject of Kevin Rudd's childhood. Mm. Whether it's effective is a different question. That it's effective or not, that is just purely political yeah. consideration. And on the question of whether people enjoy it or not, I was struck by uh, the number of letters to the editor and, uh, and columnists, in fact, who praised Paul Keating's re-entry into politics. And, and when you really look at what Paul Keating said, all he did was abuse his opponents. It was just invective. That's and yet people were saying, basically. wasn't that great? How we miss it? Yeah. And There's a bit like celebrity ones. gossip as well, I think, that people say, oh, yes, I don't read those magazines. Yeah. I mean, no, all... But, you know, Nicole yeah. and Keith, the latest updates, sort of people are mesmerised. <laughs> Paul Keating is a celebrity now. I mean, he's got a stage he... show about him. And, and, and it was like reading lines from the show, because yeah, none of them were new or kept in our eyes. Recycled. No, it was all Desiccated yeah. coconut, the Araldatus chair. Would, how would ever say that of Keating in reverse? I mean, this is the whole no, thing. What about the line that, that Peter Costello was all tip and, and no iceberg? That's an old yeah, one. Not a clever line? Not, I don't think it was particularly oh. clever. Look, it was just <laughs> sheer Keating-esque gutter abuse. Not clever, not particularly insightful, and people cheered it. You're right, there were opinion pieces in the age cheering this. Yeah. And I think that goes to this divide that you can that Labor can get away with stuff like Anthony Albanese's rabid attack on, uh, on on John Howard in Parliament the other day. They can get away with stuff the Conservatives can't because you know there's, there's something about the left that they're licensed to hate personally and think their opponents are evil, where Conservatives are supposed to have the stiff upper lip. Yeah, but they're coming and treat up with a different facts. style though with Kevin Rudd than Mark Latham and and also Kevin Rudd as opposed to Tony Abbott and Peter Costello because. Um, they go in really hard. Kevin Rudd has a sort of a forensic lawyer style mm. in, in the Parliament. It doesn't come across as abrasive as the others. But the technique is designed to elicit what we saw from Mark Latham when he was mm. really under the pump and we had that extraordinary press conference, the Lay Off My Family press conference, where he snapped. Mm. And the government is desperately hoping that it can elicit that same kind of a response from Kevin Rudd. But he doesn't have the same psychology. Oh, no, but there's also not the same character flaws. You know, Kevin Rudd's no, not but like it, that. It's also about discipline as well, that, that he knows that mm. he can't possibly afford to, to engage, to snap, to respond. He's so stayed he, aloof, hasn't he? Yeah. I mean, to the absurd degree in Parliament where he, he gets up and asks a question and then immediately turns around. And starts uh, writing uh, or well, having a conversation with someone too. this Latham famed Well, well no, Latham no, but used to toss, like, even Kim used to toss things no, across the table. No, he used to sit there impassively, the rope-a-dope strategy, for quite a while until he finally did snap. But look. I don't think it's quite intended to make uh, to make Kevin Rudd snap. I think it's just a feeling. You don't think that's a blank. Thirty seconds of footage or well, five if, seconds of footage crikey, of him. I'd like it if he snapped, but I don't think he mm. will. And even with Rudd, I think there's a license to snap. If he does it, people will think there's a bit of character, a bit of fight. That, that doesn't matter. Mm. With the Latham, it fitted a stereotype of him being. Well, I can assure you, stable. Kevin Rudd is snapping in the privacy of his office. I and don't other, doubt uh, other... it. I yeah. don't doubt it for an instant. But, but, but the point is here: it's more really to fill in a, a blank a, in the narrative to, to say that Kevin Rudd is a very hungry man who might say things that aren't quite true in order just to get but his hands on the chalice. Malcolm, the point you just made, you say that behind the scenes Kevin Rudd is starting to feel it. I, I'm, I'm hearing that, that his staff are, are feeling it as well. Oh yes, look, let's get this straight about Kevin Rudd. He's a guy who goes on interviews and, and uh, says, dang, that's a big this or, or <laughs> golly gosh. <laughs> I've got to swear to you, that's not the language he uses in, no, uh, in his office and, and to it's his not. colleagues and to his staff. And there's a, big, a fair reporters. bit of it. Well, I'm not <laughs> condemning the man for, uh, for this, I mean, just because my language is so pure. But uh, there's been a lot of that recently, and he is feeling the tension. But I think, uh, I think it was Andrew was saying, or Misha was saying, the discipline that he's shown in public 
uh, has been uh, quite extraordinary. I do find it fascinating though this idea that he's somehow this mendacious liar over the recollections of the childhood oh, no, leaving the that. farm though. Oh, um, well that's Michelle, certainly look, the construction. You know, we've all had talks with him and we know that it's an important part of his narrative and I, I, tell I think you, it's until, legitimate to scrutinise it, absolutely, mm, but until I think it's also possible that two people can live through an, the same experience and have different views about what happened. That's why we have courts and I tribunals. I swear, Misha, until the family of the farmer who hired Kevin Rudd's father mm. spoke out, I could have sworn from what I heard from the man's own mouth that Kevin Rudd was, his father died one day and he was virtually in, sleeping in a car the next. Mm. And we know now that that is not true. And sleeping in the car and for months. I just months. think, uh, even well, not months, but mm. you know. No, no, but, but, but the whole thing, yeah. And I think he told this tale in order to seem more genuinely a Labor man. And I think, well, you know, I don't. I think that is a measure of a, a bloke. I really do. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a concept. There's a thing that I call log cabinitis, where, where uh, <laughs> if you're a, if you have a, had a stable, loving family life. Uh, a, a prosperous family life with, with two parents whose longevity was matched only by their determination <laughs> to give you a wonderful education. <laughs> you are absolutely disqualified from being a politician. You've got to come from some uh, area of hardship to, uh, to, 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 to be uh, electable. And you know, they had that. a go at Kevin oh, Rudd for yes. his accent and all that, and the bloke went to a good private school, which people like me didn't do, you know. So he's done this log cabin thing. He's done this log cabin thing. And I think it's legitimate to say there are little holes in it. Now, does this disqualify him as a leader? I don't think for an instant it does. No, but Tony, Tony haven't picked very, up that point during the week and they're, they're, uh, the, the ritual now on Friday mornings when they, when they go at one another on, on national television. Tony Abbott, Julia Gillard, um, have a look at this. We will continue to probe the legitimate questions that Kevin Rudd has to answer. But, you know, Julia's getting all sanctimonious, Carl. I mean, why was Wayne Swan on there yesterday attacking the Prime Minister uh, just because some dodgy individual gate crashed a prime ministerial lunch. You know, Julia, the halo is slipping, <laughs> frankly. I while, mean, how do you, and, how can and you while, compare that while, with what's been going on the other way? And while Kevin was trying to be Saint Kevin, uh, you had other Labor people out there saying there are very serious questions for the Prime Minister no, to answer. No. And how about that issue, the dodgy individual gate crashing the Prime Ministerial lunch? I just wish I could get the words porn mogul and sleaze king into my copy more often. Um, it's, it's, but but, she's right, but um, Tony Abbott's right on that, that it mm. was fascinating to see both Wayne Swan and, and Kevin Rudd sort of saying, well, I'm sure the Prime Minister has a reasonable yes. explanation for this, you know, <laughs> drawing attention to it but trying to be seen to... Well, um, but really, you know, it's like yeah. the Prime Minister shook the hand of a bloke who shook the hand who once knew someone who was a porn king, you know. <laughs> I mean, but this is where we've got seven to, degrees of separation. He probably knew yeah, Hitler and, that way. And the yeah. reason that the 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 opposition is, is treading so warily at the moment, of, of course, if, like keep in mind, they didn't demand Senator Campbell's resignation. They didn't demand Senator Santoro's resignation. Mm. But they got both of them. It's because mm. they're a little gun shy, given uh, given the Kevin Rudd experience. It, it, it's arguable that the only casualty uh, that pe operatives of the Labor Party have been able to bring about is Kelvin Thompson, because mm. there's some suggestion that it was. Uh, an internal leak about his uh, reference for Tony Mockbell that, uh, that caused him the trouble, nothing that the Libs did. But I think Wayne Swan is right when he pointed to a certain toxicity uh, within the Liberal Party in, uh, in Queensland mm. and Santo Santoro has been a key figure in the faction of operations there and maybe he's paying uh, a price for that rather than uh, anything else he's done. And that raises the question uh, who will replace him in the Ministry and I'm told that the, uh, the Prime Minister is overseas of course but he, the, the office phone is running hot. And one thought uh, being put forward is that, well, look, it's the blokes who have screwed up in Queensland. It's time to give a woman a go. Theresa Gambaro. And then maybe Theresa Gambaro. Yeah, well, she wouldn't be a bad choice, I don't think. But shouldn't they stop looking at symbols and simply start for the next Here's year the thing, to Andrew, just at least It's OK somehow within the coalition to have a quota system for the National Party, but not OK to have a quota system for women who make up a much bigger proportion of the coalition. I think quotas <laughs> are probably what got the well, government in scrap problem. scrap the with. National Party quota then, no, if, you know. Well, whatever. I think talent right now is what the government... Sure, exactly. Like the and I think Shut Peter Slipper is going to come through <laughs> on the outside <laughs> and at super. last. At last. <laughs> this moment in the sun. That's, the, that's not to say, by the way, I don't think... You know, uh, but who, this, who would be better on merit? I don't. Her, I'm not in, saying that's the, that's the argument. I'm not saying that she's because she's a woman. She's not qualified. I'm just saying don't start saying quotas because that's what got the government a little bit. That's why Santoro is at the head of the queue against uh, above others. Well, let's go to the New South Wales election now. And uh, I thought the uh, your newspaper, Malcolm, summed it up pretty well in an, in an intro during the week when the, when they wrote uh, after spending another day saying sorry 
Mr Yemmer will lead the most unpopular government in 20 years to a thumping victory on March the 24th. Why so? It is odd, isn't it? I mean, uh, that uh, a, a couple of things uh, seem to stand out. One is that that uh, a, a long-serving government doesn't become a, a tired government if you renew the leadership and give it enough time and the new leader is solid enough to carry through. Uh, that would be something that some Liberals might be eyeing the closer we get to the federal election. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is that uh, there is nothing to, to beat solid preparation. 20 years or so ago, the Liberal uh, Nick Griner drew up this enormous economic plan for, uh, for New South Wales and, and, and it included cost cutting and things like that uh, and got elected uh, uh, against Labor from opposition. Uh, Peter Dedman comes up with this hazy plan of funding all these things from sacking 20,000 public servants, mm. which doesn't go down well. And also, the more you look at it, you've got to think that these public servants are earning at least $10 million a year uh, to, if he's going to get the money to pay for some of these projects. Dedman is not believable. I Emma is. That's the clear thing. But I don't, I don't quite buy the it's because they changed a leader and therefore they've got a fresh mandate or a fresh start or trust this kind of thing because you've seen with Barry Unsworth it didn't work in, in Victoria, Joan Kerner it didn't work in Western Australia, Carmen Lawrence. It, it, I really think it comes more down to the credibility as you, as you summed up at the end of the lack of credibility of the Liberals and really this is the 21st defeat straight on a state and territory basis that the Liberal Party is having around yeah. Australia and you have to think you wouldn't give two cents for the Liberals on a state basis. They have lost the plot completely. Well, the fact and that I, they didn't even have a trans detailed transport plan to kind of have in the bag for this week's debacle is quite extraordinary. But the other thing is that the, the bizarre side of Peter Devon a week out saying, well, it's all uh, over, they've won it. Let's have a look at this uh, because Malcolm Farr didn't make the point before that uh, that Peter Dedman is unbelievable. I wonder whether he's unbelievable on this point. This poll today, if it's taken in key seats and if it's correct, then the message is very clear. The Labor Party is going to win the election in a week. That was an extraordinary contribution, uh, but the bookmakers agree. The ALP is $1.05 and the Coalition $8. I don't think that's, that's so right? extraordinary. I mean, Peter Beattie goes around like that. Even when he's ahead, he's saying, we're behind, we're going to lose, it's terrible. I think it's getting the same <coughs> vote out. Uh, take, you know, just it doesn't. It, it, there's no risk of us trying actually winning if you for vote for us. Vote. That's what it's trying to minimise the, the damage. Vote, yeah, saying, you know, send a message. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't think that's so extraordinary. I think what's extraordinary is the fact that he didn't have policies. He didn't have a clear alternative. He's bumbled. I mean, it's just terrible. I mean, godly. But God. why are the lessons not being learned? After every election, the prime minister goes around and, and, and says to these leaders, "Look, this is where you went wrong. You didn't put forward an alternative strategy." Can't fatten strategy. the pig on market day in politics. Yeah, his favourite saying, that, and, and all the rest. Been and bad. the liberals have all, including the uh, federal level. I mean, on climate change, that's one of the reasons climate change has come to bite the liberals federally. They've never ske sketched out or prosecute an intellectual case against this alarmism. And so when it comes, they just go with the flow. Part of the problem is also the talent drain. So because the Libs yes. are in government federally in power, right. talented Liberal people who want to be candidates get sort of gravitated towards that, that sphere. And perhaps it's time mm. for the Liberal Party to look at the John Brumby style approach where you take someone who's a reasonable talent out of a federal seat and you say, this person's going to be the hand-picked next state opposition leader. Now, there are difficulties in doing that, logistical ones and... and but still, I, I think that kind of headhunting is absolutely... You're absolutely right. I'd also wonder whether the switch to four-year terms is actually killing oppositions around the country. No, it no, is no, too long no. for people to sit there for four years. You, you recruit someone, right? When the parties are low, you say you might lead the party. Realistically, they've probably got eight years of sitting there twiddling their thumbs in the best productive years of their life doing nothing at a low salary. The need to have long no, Barry, no. three <laughs> years to <laughs> <is> much better. <laughs> Malcolm? <laughs> the prime reason why the Liberals in New South Wales aren't, aren't um, uh, prepared for this is factional instability within the party, which mm. has been going on for more than four years and has just been uh, uh, ruthless. And it's taken up all the energy, all the creativity and uh, all the time of those who should have been uh, doing the preparations. And it's as simple as that. No, but, but that, once again, it's not that simple. Factions oh. are actually quite healthy in some respects. Like Labor has had factions for a long time. It's useful in managing I said debate. instability. Not it, the existence of what factions. What happens if you don't instability. have ideas, people rally around people, and that's when it gets bitter and nasty and completely unproductive. But, but Andrew, would you not concede, people have a limited number of hours in every working day or every working week. 
And if you have to spend huge amounts of time, inordinate amounts of time, managing a faction, plotting your next war against to knock someone else's candidate off in the seat next mm. door, whatever else, that takes away from the time that you've got to get out there, think creatively mm. about policy ideas, put up an alternative vision and cost it well. Uh, I, I know, like, it's, it's a question of degree. The existence of factions in themselves are not yeah. uh, yeah. a sign of ill health. In fact, I think, as I said, it's a question, it's, a, it's an ability to raise arguments, have them thrashed out mm -hmm. and manage but their dissent. I don't think it's a problem. And, and the other factor too, done. of course, was somehow Labor's managed to refresh itself and present itself as a different government to that led by Bob Carr. Well, you couldn't get a, a more different uh, candidate than Bob Carr, uh, a, a bloke who's... Uh, uh, suburban, uh, has got a vowel at the end of his name, uh, very much a family man, uh, low key. No pretensions to uh, studying great literary characters of our doesn't time. Doesn't study German <laughs> doesn't during hang questions. Out with time. <laughs> <laughs> um. All right, on that, on that note, on the panel this morning, Mr. Schubert, Malcolm Farr, and Andrew Bolt, they'll be back in a few minutes. But time now for more on the New South Wales election. It's over to Mike Bowers and his regular segment, Talking Pictures. I'm Michael Bowles and I'm pictorial editor with the Sydney Morning Herald. I've come to State Parliament in Macquarie Street to the President's Dining Room where we're going to dip a toe in the water that is the stagnant pool of the New South Wales State election and I'm joined by the wonderful Warren Brown. Mike, it's a pleasure as it, always. Water's been an incredible issue during the campaign, um, whether you like the sort of bland aftertaste of uh, desal. And that's the desal. And this one, I understand, is the, the Debnam once through the system um, uh, reconstituted recycled water. Well, off you go. What's the desal like? Mm, slightly aftertasty. Mm. Mm. I think this should be bottled as deja vu water. I'm sure. I've, I've had this before, I'm sure. It's, oh, it's got lumps in it. Anyway. It's been sort of a, a, a huge issue during the campaign and, and, and we've had the, uh, the candidates both out sort of drinking and proving the fact that they'll both drink their, uh, their product. Yeah, it's a bit sad, isn't it? Not like the old days. I mean, you know, people going out there and, and drinking water on the campaign. It's fairly, that's indicative of the whole campaign. It's very lacklustre. It's very dull, isn't it? <laughs> well, I like the water. Colourless. <laughs> yeah. Tasteless. Yes, that's right. <laughs> and lukewarm. And failing to engage. Yeah, indeed. Absolutely. Um, Every sort of picture of Peter Debman is trying to ram home the fact that he's sporty. Is there any sport this chap will not attempt? I'm not sure about this, but I'm fascinated because the London Times ran a story about, about uh, Peter Debman being like James Bond. I'm quite <laughs> surprised about that. Didn't they liken him to Frank Spencer as well? Oh, James Bond, just Frank Spencer. Lacking the beret? Indeed. <laughs> there are just amazing pictures <laughs> of him doing uh, various things. He's on a... On a Yes. A stair machine, I think yeah, that one's cool. called. Yeah. Um, um, ditch the budgies there and he's yeah. into the board shorts. They're more like emu smugglers than budgie smugglers, <laughs> I reckon. <laughs> oh, look, here he is. He's, look, he's with sort of the crocodile hunter's grandfather here. So what is your view on the budgies? To budgie or not to budgie? Oh, look, I don't know about the budgie smugglers. I mean, in, in Peter's case, they look a bit more like zebra finch smugglers, <laughs> don't they, rather than budgie smugglers. I'm not quite sure why he's... Why is he bothering? Look, you're either a budgie man or you're not, basically. Uh, yeah. And, you know, the world is divided between those that budgie and smuggle it and those that don't. Mate, I'm a neck-to-knee man myself. Yeah. <laughs> now, the Premier, Maurice Yemma, he's, he's tried sort of valiantly to, you know, join in on the sporting stuff. It's not quite the same, though, is it? No. I mean, it's a Ferrari convention, and here you have a Morris coming along here. <laughs> <laughs> and a Morris minor coming along to launch a Ferrari convention. What's going on there? Um... Sort of kicking the ball, trying his hardest. He to do looks, it. he looks a natural there, doesn't he? Look, look at the, look at the expression on his face. It's bizarre. I mean, he just doesn't really sort of cut the mustard as, as a kind of, you know, as a, you know, you sort of your, your great footy sporting hero. <laughs> I love this photo. It was up, <laughs> up uh, in Broken Hill. At least the kids trying to inject a bit of life straight into the heart. Yeah, Oof. a wooden stake wouldn't have gone astray, I'm sure. Um, a lot of the shots, both the election launches and, and various other things, haven't really you know, set the world on fire. Well, it's been an absolute dog of a... On both parties, dogs of campaigns. I mean, here we have Maurice Yemi here talking about, you know, we're heading in the right direction. Well, New South Wales hasn't looked so bad for so long. Here he is, of course, driving his fabulous Morris Minor <laughs> with the big old sort of carpet bag of the campaign that he's dragging through. <laughs> There's more to do, but we're heading in the right direction. Yeah. Broom, broom. The, the photo of the campaign has got to be Prue Goward, Warren, who's on the back of Charlie Lynn's bike in uh, in Goulburn. Yeah, born to be mild. Born to be <laughs> mild. mild. Well, Warren, are you uh, prepared to go out on a limb and predict the uh, result? I am. I reckon I'll get hepatitis C from drinking the Debenham water. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the, and the D-cells is making me thirstier. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> it's always a pleasure as usual, Warren. And, and, and what I've got to say is you're either a budgie smuggler or you're not. Go the budgies! Oh. <laughs>
That looks more like a tawny frog now. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of keeping... Uh, uh, keeping uh, dressed to a minimum, Peter Beattie in the, in the Queensland Parliament has said he's going to do his bit for climate change. He's turning, turning the air conditioning off, keeping the, the chamber at about 25 degrees and as compensation, the guys can take, take off their jackets. Here he is. This is about bringing this Queensland chamber into the 21st century and acknowledging that Lee, we live in the tropics. Well, my real concern is, is, is the Premier going to be wearing his budgie smugglers into the parliament? <laughs> That's the question I want to know. So they can all look like they're in a menswear catalogue with that sort of slung over the shoulder, That's pointing funny. at something over there. <laughs> it brings back memories, does it not, of Don Dunstan? Yeah. In the South Australian Parliament. We'll have a look at some uh, some shots of... This is when the world was black and white, of course, and they, they were, in fact, pink, weren't they? Those, uh, yes, right. they were indeed. Those pink hot pants. Hot pants, but it... Uh, with well, the knee-high socks. Mm, very attractive look. Very good. Not only sh shocked Adelaide in Australia, but I think the world at the time. <laughs> Adelaide could have done with some shocking at the time. <laughs> very apt. It appealed to part of the community, I think. Yeah. It's, it's, this is not dragging, <laughs> this is not dragging <laughs> Queensland in the 21st century. This is dragging it back to Stone Age. I mean, it's a, it's a concession to global warming, so let's not have air conditioners. But it's, even then, it's trimming. Let's still have them at 25. I mean, you know, if he really yeah. believes in global warming, turn them off. Turn now, last off. week we drew attention to Peter Costello's <coughs> remarks about uh, Ross Lightfoot and the, um, and the significance of being a senator. We'll remind ourselves of that. Senator Lightfoot um, uh, does not hold any position in the government and doesn't have any position of influence in relation to any commercial decisions. So senators uh, have no influence in relation to commercial decisions. <laughs> now, this week, Petro Giorgio, of course, was having a go at the government over its citizenships test. He doesn't like it very much, and so this is what Peter Costello said of his backbencher. Well, Petro Giorgio is not a member of the government. Uh, he is uh, a backbencher who is entitled to his view. Sort of reinforces this whole concept of the executive running the show, doesn't it? Oh, mm. It does indeed. To hell with Parliament, uh, yeah. Well, that puts him in his place. <laughs> I, think, I think Peter Costello probably would like Petro Georgia not to be a member of the government, but unfortunately he is. But it's a bit of a nonsense given that the coalition MPs are the ones that, you know, cho notionally choose the leadership and the executive government. Look, I, I, but the, the, the breakout from Petro Georgia indicates to me that this party is starting to stink of decay. Not that it, Petro said anything wildly offensive, but there seems to me a... a at one side, a number of people that don't care almost if they don't, if they lose, and another lot, lot that are carrying on like it, as if they don't care. You know, the San, Santa, Santoro, and I just think this government's got a hell of a job to do to uh, to stop this smell. It's beginning to be a narrative. This government is on the nose. Yeah, mm. though the first thing that seems to happen is that the backbenchers, particularly in the marginal seats, get very nervous about this sort of thing. Are you detecting any evidence that that's happening? And I certainly have it up until this point. Um, there was a little bit of a breakout a couple of weeks ago where Kerry Bartlett in the coalition party room actually made exactly that point and said, well, you know, for you guys on slightly high margins, mm. you might think it's great to be speaking out on things that you're passionate about, but spare a thought for the people in the marginal seats where uh, these things can make a big difference. And, and also I think uh, the run-of-the-mill backbencher, um, whilst nervous, as you would in, in election time when you've been in government for 11 years, is remarkably um, uh, at ease with John Howard uh, as the leader. That's true. Uh, and uh, they have great faith in him and in Peter Costello uh, to bring them home next October, November. So uh, it's quite limited and peripheral, any sort of criticism of the government as such internal. Well, that brings us now to a letter in, in, in The Australian during the week, a letter to the editor, and it said that Malcolm Turnbull is uh, sitting back grinning at John Howard's three sad clowns destroying themselves, as, uh, as the letter writer put it. So let's have a look at Dabbitt and Costello and what they were up to during the week. Um, and first of all, have a look at Peter Costello was out helping the Leukaemia Foundation and um, shaving the head of some hapless victim uh, for, the, for the world's greatest shave. <laughs> If only I could shave budget expenditures like this. What's it like being fleeced by the treasurer? <laughs> <laughs> OK. Party staffer <laughs> too. <laughs> well, that was Peter Costello. Now let's see what Tony Abbott has been up to. And Friday night in Sydney, he joined uh, Bronwyn Bishop on stage at a fundraiser.
look, a it's couple a of swirls indeed. It's the Weimar Republic all over. <laughs> yes, now, you know what Berlin decadence on the way out. Out. What it reminds me of is that notorious footage of Gareth Evans jitterbugging at the True Believers Ball. Mm. Yeah. I wonder if this will come back to... Well, they're not <laughs> sad clowns, they're happy clowns. Final observation. Um, the government's got more trouble ahead on its access card. There is going to be internal resistance and some of the concerns are not for budging. Some 1,200 people have emailed, sent emails to Cynthia Bannon in hospital in Perth wishing her all the best, and I think that's a wonderful response. Absolutely. Um, if John Howard really is going to campaign hard on Iraq this year, I think he'll lose the election. I think it might be time to re uh, think about talking about sorries and changing of directions. And that's it for this week. I'll be back with Offsiders at 10.30, but coming up next, Dylan Collar and...